Welcome to the Scott and Holman Podcast. Back here talking all things Houston Cougars, as we always do, a little earlier than usual on a Tuesday night. The sports sporting schedule finally allows us to record what I think is our probably most ideal time of the week to talk a super action-packed week that was, week that will be. My word tonight, guys, is gratitude because I really do love when kind of the winter and spring sports seasons meet. Like, it's a lot of podcasting work, but as a sports fan, believe it or not, we don't view everything entirely through the lens of the weekly podcast that we've all been doing to some degree for the last nine to 10 years. But it is really cool to be like, oh yeah, we have like a little softball this week. We got baseball coming back this weekend. We've got uh, men's basketball in full swing coming off. No biggie, your 10th straight win against the Cincinnati Bearcats, something that just doesn't feel entirely real. You know, no factually it to be correct. Dustin back all three of us together. Uh, how you doing, bud? Uh, I'm doing well. Uh, I'm excited to be talking to you guys. Um, I'd be like, Five percent more excited about uh, all the sports you were talking about. If the forecast for this weekend looked a little better in Houston, if I liked our chances of getting uh, as, many, as many of these bat and ball games in as I would like to this weekend, so we'll have to uh, we'll have to see how that goes. But uh, excited about uh, big Cougar basketball win, some big games coming up, and, and excited to be here chatting with you guys. Bobby, how you doing, friend? I'm good, man. I'm good. It's uh, another week. We got a big retail holiday coming up this weekend, so. Yay for work for me. That means gainful employment for me. So, uh, yeah, overall doing pretty well. I was going to say, you're part of the the two groups of people that have any kind of, like, I, I guess, President's Day having any effect on uh, what they do. <laughs> you and federal contractors, without giving, giving away my day job. I am not a federal <laughs> contractor, but I, I deal with a fair amount of people who are federal or federal adjacent uh, in what they do, uh, which I, I had to be reminded, like, oh, yeah, by the way, like, we're – one of my clients is just like, yeah, like our accounting office is closed because it's President's Day. And I was just like, oh, yeah, there's a President's <laughs> Day. And I just remember various random just like the mattress, but President's Day sale. Blah, blah, blah. Yep. Really just want to get a deal on a silly posturepedic. Uh, shout out to you, uh, U.S. Presidents. Get this back on track here. Talking Houston Cougars. Got to mention at the top, of course, like we always do. Please, please, please support our friends at the 1012 Network, at TN12Network, wherever you do social media, the 1012 Podcast, and many other great Big 12 sister podcast that we are affiliated with. Of course, we'd love, love, love if you don't already, like a number of you do, if you'd support our show financially by going to patreon.com slash sh podcast. Of course, gonna mention our friends Charlie Hustle had a great weekend uh as a Kansas City brand and uh somebody or brand that has a lot of like Chiefs affiliated stuff, which that, that was one of the things that really stood out to me when we first got contact with Charlie Hustle. It's just like, man, these guys do a lot of stuff with like the Chiefs, which again, like. Right now, not a bad NFL franchise to uh, have some connection to. Going through a bit of a renaissance, it uh, certainly seems like, uh, as a football team. So big congrats to them on their Chiefs winning the Super Bowl. And you can congratulate yourself, Cougar fans, by uh, if you haven't done so already. Or if you've done so but are thinking, maybe I could use a little bit more apparel in my collection. Uh, check it out, Charlie Hustle's absolutely fantastic Houston Cougar collection of wearables. Uh, crew neck shirts, hoodies. If, Charlie, if, if you want a cool design... Cougar basketball, Cougar sports generally. Charlie Hustle's got it. Bobby's wearing one of my personal favorites. I am not wearing it right this moment, but it is one of uh, one of my mainstays here in the colder months of the year. The uh, red Cougars crew neck, really simple, really good, and I think very importantly, really comfortable. Of course, you just by listening to this show, whether you're a Cougar fan or just an interested observer, you can, on all of Charlie Hustle's fantastic wearables, use our promo code SHP15, that's SHP15, and save 15% off any Charlie Hustle order that you uh, are treating yourself or treating those in your life to making so that's charliehustle.com uh vintage made fresh guys let's talk some houston cougar men's basketball i think we got a lead with uh a cougar team that had you know and i'm going to talk about this in a second i think a team that had significantly fewer stakes significantly fewer things on the line with this game than the opponent the team that you were going to this weekend this game i don't think i'm being arrogant or unfair in saying this game had a lot more I think in terms of a uh, positive impact or a secondary benefit for winning to the Cincinnati Bearcats, the Houston Cougars. And yet here we are on Tuesday night talking about a Cougar win, a Cougar win that ne wasn't necessarily easy to get to point A to point B on. It was a roller coaster, if you will, a game that refused to truly let you relax at any point until about, I think the final handful of seconds of the game. But nonetheless, I think just a really satisfying Cougar win guys. Yeah, we knew it was a game that was going to be really tough. We knew it was kind of one of those any win by any margin is a good win type of uh, games. And basically any Big 12 game you play on the road, I think that's 
that's clearly the case, especially, you know, if you're Houston and you don't play on the road at uh, Oklahoma state or West Virginia, I think every, and even West Virginia has beaten some teams. So, I mean, at this point, really, you know, no such thing as a bad big 12 road win, especially one against the Cincinnati team that, you know, has, like we mentioned, has given every team that they've played a tough game. Like no one has beaten them by more than five on the year. Houston didn't still didn't do it. Um, maybe Iowa state will do it tonight. They're playing right now. I don't know. Um, but no, right. yeah, you mentioned the, 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 the just crazy game of runs Houston 17, four to start the game. Uh, where at one point the Bearcats had a 28 to eight run over the end of the first half, the beginning of the second, just as it was looking like since that might, might be taking the game over Houston responded with a 19 to three run, uh, Houston had a 10 point lead with under four minutes to go only for Cincinnati to rally again, get within one possession multiple times, including uh, the closing seconds when it was a three point game. It looked like Cincinnati might be able to force a steal on the back quarter, get a 10 second call. Uh, but then Houston uh, got it up to Juwan Roberts for the uncontested dunk to salt this one away. And I thought it was fitting that Wani got the dunk to steal it because he was fantastic in this one, uh, 20 points on 10 to 15 shooting. Uh, only one free throw attempt because nobody ever fouls Juwan Roberts. It's remarkable. I don't know how it happens, but the man takes a bunch of shots inside. Lots of contact. Never, never fouls. It's remarkable. Um, eight rebounds in this one as well for Wani. Four of those rebounds on the offensive glass, which was a huge key for Houston. I thought they were going to need, uh, I mentioned in the preview, I thought they're going to need to get their extra shots via turnovers in this one because Cincinnati has been one of the best rebounding teams in the country on the year, but Houston went into their own building, kicked their butts on the glass, plus eight in offensive rebounds and plus eight in second chance points in a game that you won by five points. So um, despite Cincinnati's uh, impressive overall team size, Houston uh, plus 16 points in the paint in this one as well. So really impressed with the win for Houston, especially the way that they, they went in there and just kind of played bully ball and out toughed a, uh, a tough team in their own, uh, in their own building. Yeah. For me, you pointed out the big, the big one for me was, uh, was Wani, right? Uh, 10 of 15, 20 points. I don't know how comfortable I am with Wani taking 15 shots, right? I don't know, but look, if you're going you to be pretty comfortable, right? No, what I was going to say is if you're going to shoot 66% on those 15 shots, take 15. I'm cool. You could take 20 if you're going to shoot 66%. Um, big concern, you know, not that I'm one to pick nits in this game, uh, but a little concerning shooting 18% from the, from, uh, beyond the arc, um, going three of 16. Don't love that. If we're trying to find something from this game, but we said it would be a defensive knockdown drag out fight. And, it was right. Both teams, to your point, Dustin, uh, went extended periods without scoring, and we thought that would happen. And it was just, it was definitely a game of haymakers. You know, we call them the runs. You know, it was a game of runs, things like that. But you came out, you 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 threw your best shot at them, and they came back. They would stand. They withstood the pressure. Came back, put it back on you. Um, had that big run at the end of the first half. Uh, what was it? What did you say, Dustin? Twenty eight. 28 eight. to eight over the yeah, 28, eight. Um, you know, they put that on you and you kind of had to take it and fifth, thir- uh, one and two thirds arena. I refuse to call it fifth third. Uh, it's one and two thirds Reduce arena was absolutely popping. And it was just insane. That atmosphere was great. Obviously it's not going to be fog Allen or something like that, but Sam and I were kind of talking about this. Um, I think yesterday, maybe the day before that, like one, we're we're uh we were talking about how we're glad we're not, we're not going to Lubbock. That's a completely different yes. uh, thing here. That we're that is because we were talking about it after the after the game last night, and we were like, man, we're really glad we don't have to go to Lubbock. And I said, you know who's been playing tough at home? UCF. And Sam goes, one of the good things is that we've played there before. The guys have been in that arena. That they've won in that arena when it's popping. When you're the one of the top teams in the country. Same thing happened in Cincy, and I I could see that atmosphere looked insane at Cincy, and it was definitely a game where you could tell was a it's not a make or break game for them, but a win in that game almost puts them in the tournament without any question, right? Gets them off the bubble, does all that. Now, is a loss to Houston going to be the thing that kicks them off the bubble or something like that? Not necessarily, but if they win that game, that's a huge win for them, and the atmosphere showed it, and the guy showed up. This is a I've said this to Sam, uh, and I may have said it to you as well, Dustin. This is a team that looks like they can take teams' best shots, and that's what you need in March. Yeah, the announced attendance of this one, 12,715, was the largest since uh, since he renovated Fifth Third Arena during the 2017-2018 uh, season. And knowing that fan base, and I was there in the building in 2019 for their regular season finale, it was 12,715 butts and seats. And 
that is a really loud arena. I would say before I went to Fog Allen, that was probably the loudest arena that I had seen a game in prior to that. That is a really good basketball fan base. I mean, that's to, you know, to give us some credit, like the years that since he was just this absolute indomitable force, uh, we were largely, you know, winning nine to 13 games a year. So U of H may not, doesn't have the backbone of since he just being this incredible basketball program for so, so many years, but that's a great basketball fan base. And I, I'm glad if nothing else that this game has the juice from since he being, I think, the best team you know, they've had in in several years, certainly since uh, McCronin's last year. Agree with you, Bobby, that I, I think this this is a team that really, like I said at the top, needed to needed this game more than the Cougs needed. I mean, if the Cougs lose this game, you know, maybe you're not as nailed on of a one seed right now. But I mean, it's a true road loss in a quad one situation. Would like to have it, but not not the worst thing to necessarily lose it. Whereas I think if Cincy won this game. I think I think they're on a lot more people's last four in, or maybe even depending on how much the win is valued, uh, last four buys necessarily. Like I, I think that's the level of motivation there. And yet that the Cougars went out there and yes, wasn't easy, wasn't uh necessarily the most straightforward road to get there, but that that this team led for a pretty good chunk of regulation against this team, I think, with their best home atmosphere in a good long while, that's really cool. And that just tells you, I think the toughness of these guys. My favorite stat for this one, guys, I want to make sure I attribute it properly. That's courtesy of uh, Chad Brendel, the owner of the Cincy site, bearcatjournal.com. Jamal Shedd missed 17 shots that weren't immediately followed by a dead ball on Saturday. Guys, out of those 17 misses, U of H grabbed the offensive board 10 times. That's unreal. And it kind of tracks because I remember from watching this one in real time to looking at the box score after, my first reaction was that Jamal Shed shooting line worked, looked a lot worse than I expected. But I mean, I guess considering so many of those misses were rebound, it didn't feel like he was missing as many as he did. And I mean, you can never say the offensive rebounding effort is about one guy, but you both have said it. Wani Roberts, I, I think heart and soul of this team. As always, Wani and Javier Francis both had four. Malik Wilson had three. Even in an off day, Damian Dunn gave you a couple as well. And yeah, you can't overstate the kind of game that Roberts had. And I think it's long past time to put him in the pantheon of really, really great Kelvin Sampson era U of H players. I mean, right now, by necessity, this program has been bringing in a higher rated level of recruit, whether via high school or the portal. Necessary when you're a Big 12 program. And it doesn't really appear that Kelvin Sampson is not is compromising on culture and bringing those guys in. But it's still really cool to have, you know, to see the bedrock of this program is still tough as nails, maybe somewhat overlooked three-star type guys like Roberts. And we talked about the Cincy team in the preview, so much size on paper. Three different rotation or starting big men listed 6'11 or taller. And yet those three guys, them referencing uh, Ben to Ogo, Lockett, and Reynolds, they combined for two fewer rebounds than Wani and Javier each had on their own. And, and this is a, a good rebounding team. Like even after this game, since he's top 10 nationally in offensive rebounding and top 30 in opponent offensive rebounding, by any metric, they're really good at getting and preventing opponents from getting offensive rebounds. And U of H just so thoroughly dominated that aspect of the game in Cincy's building with a guy listed at six, seven, who has a bad knee. Like that's cool, man. That's, that's a culture win. Yeah. yeah. I, I've you, I, one of you tweeted it. I don't know who I have an idea of who it's always good mystery, it, but, but the, uh, but the uh, me, me and whichever one of you tweeted it Sweet. reaction when they, uh, when Wani Roberts does anything positive, like Taylor Swift and one of her friends, yeah, uh, that was Blake Lively. Like, was it like one of her friends? Yeah, that's absolutely Blake Lively. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, uh, uh, put that on Blake Lively's resume. One of her yeah. friends. <laughs> but, but I genuinely didn't know this. This was not me trying to like talk shit name. about Blake Lively. I genuinely like. <laughs> Space that it was like lively in the picture. Yeah. So anyway, sorry, Bobby. So, continue. So, anyways, um, Wani Roberts. I don't know if he will ever become my favorite Cougar basketball player ever. It's tough to beat Fabian White, but he's making a case. I love when Wani gets the ball. He's down in the post, and we just let Wani cook. It, like you said, Sam, it, it was a culture move. Uh, Wani is the heart and soul of this team when it comes to the culture of this team. And it's beyond exciting to see him watch him over the last couple of years, take that next step with his offensive game as well. 
Yeah, I wanted to circle back to something you said earlier, Bobby, which is the, the three point shooting being off in this one. And to me, three point shooting in basketball, I mean, it's 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 kind of like a pitcher having their best stuff or not in a baseball game. You just can't control it. Some days you got your best stuff, some days you don't. Obviously, some players, some teams are better three point shooters than others, but whether you have a good average or bad shooting game relative to your baseline, I think is just kind of one of the one of those random things. So if anything, playing in the atmosphere like that, where like Sam said, um, you know, the entire the other team had so much more to play for, had had the crowd behind their backs. And you came out there and kind of didn't have your fastball, so to speak, in terms of the three-point shot to still get the win. Uh, I thought makes this even more of an impressive culture win for the Cougars. I can't believe we are like almost done talking about this game and no one has talked about Malik Wilson yet because he was. So I had good I had a note. I had a note if you guys did mention it, but 21, 21 minutes off the bench uh, with LJ Cryer in foul trouble uh, for a lot of this one. Wilson did a little bit of everything: seven rebounds, three key steals, four points, two assists. Just broadly played a lot of very good defense. And kind of the the concern that we had with Terrence Arsenal going down is who's who's your guy that just comes off the bench when you need some minutes doesn't need the ball in his hands necessarily but is not going to do do something bad with it when it is in his hands and just plays really really good defense on the air on the other end and just kind of makes three or four plays that are just maybe don't show up real big in the box score but just end up being really big in the in the course of this game and that was Malik Wilson in the second half of this one and he's someone who's obviously just super veteran guy um, you know, just second year in the program after not playing last year. So for him, uh, you know, to finally, after all this time and effort that he's put into so this program over the last couple of years to finally, I think, have a real breakout game. I uh, was really excited for him and, and was really happy that, uh, that he picked this game to have a breakout one because I think Houston probably doesn't win this game if Malik Wilson doesn't uh, step up in a big way the way he did. Yeah. I, I was yeah. just going to add, like everything you said, will say, I think you kind of covered it there. I wanted to also point out that Wilson and JoJo Tugler both played such a big chunk of that 19 to three run where U of H turned that 38 31 deficit where early second half, it really looked like this team was on the ropes. The, you know, the crowd was ravenous. Like since he had just so overturned that really good U of H start and that you were able to play so much good basketball with, uh, with a guy who we weren't even sure was going to be on the team this year uh, back in the summer and a true freshman. Like those guys, those guys, I think we've said it a lot here culture guys right there and it's it's so cool i realize like different you know 50 year guy versus freshman like obviously jojo tugger we're not seeing a fully realized college player yet but both two really tough dudes who like you'd want to win a basketball game with again just want to say this also guys i know i said at the top winning 10 straight head-to-head against cincinnati and three straight fifth third is crazy like i would never imagine that eight or nine years ago and i realize this isn't cincinnati's best era of basketball but I'll just go back a little bit. I remember during the 2017, 2018 season, we played Cincy on the road. I think that was the year they played uh, away from home because they were having their own arena renovations. I think we both did our uh, respective arena renovations during the same season. U of H got to this big first half lead against Cincinnati. And since he was able to still come back and eventually win that game by double digits, I went back and looked, they went 80 to 70 and led by 13 with like a minute left. You know, really back then, since he felt inevitable, like U of H would, always have some mental block that kept them from regularly beating that opponent. Guys, we're the inevitable team now. Like, mm-hmm. and we've been for quite some time, and I have to kind of pinch myself because that's really cool. All right, are we all done with any serious-ish analysis of the game? Because I have two very dumb, tangentially related points to the game that I want to want to hit real quick before we end it uh, i just wanted to kind of you know underscore what you said about jojo tugler played 20 minutes in this one uh mm-hmm. with a lot of you know more than average due to uh i think partially to javier being in foul trouble which by the way i don't know if we need to hire a witch doctor or whatever the hell but we made like one comment about i did and that's my bad about is pretty good at not getting in foul trouble this year and he's had like what three out of his last four <laughs> games or something gets in foul trouble i don't know what we need to do to undo that jinx but my goodness. We're willing to. We're willing to do I'm willing it. To do sage. I'm open to ideas. Did you just say you'll burn sage? <laughs> yes, I said I'll burn sage. I'll do whatever it takes, Bobby. <laughs> okay, I'm in. I'm in. Whatever it takes. Uh, hit my two dumb things really quick. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Guys, if I have to hear Fran Fischel say one more time, you know, Jamal Shedd's mother committed to Kelvin Sampson before Jamal did. <laughs> Guys, I'm going to fucking destroy my flat screen like one of those staged videos where a sports fan pretends he's so mad his team lost, he destroys the flat screen. Over this guy. Can we please have that weirdo Mark Adams back on our broadcast like we did for I AAC games? Adams. Yeah, I liked Mark Adams. I mean, it's a champagne problem because Fran is only getting put on big matchups and we have lots of big matchups. But, guy, come on, get a second anecdote about Jamal Shedd. I don't 
want to listen to this every time. Nothing against Jamal Shedd. Nothing against his mother. There's probably lots of good Jamal Shedd slash Jamal Shedd's mom anecdotes out there. You just go, you know, she Jamal committed to Kelvin Sampson like... before Jamal did. Bobby, did you know that? Yeah. Hey, Sam. Hey, okay. Sam. I, I don't know if you know this. Damian Dunn kicked out of his first Houston practice. Yeah, he did. He also did. That one too. Hey, was he not uh, ready for what Kelvin Sampson demands of his players, Dustin? Interesting. Okay, let, let me ask you this. Would you rather hear that or that our punter, Dane Roy, is 31 and he used to sell ice cream? Uh, the, which da- one, the, the Dane which Roy one, one was used honestly. more? <laughs> the Dane Roy one just makes me laugh. Nothing against the Jamal Shedd anecdote, but it just doesn't, it's not a, it's not laughing anecdote. It's like, oh, okay. That's mildly interesting the first time I heard it and then just like progressively, just like a second anecdote. All right. My second yeah, dumb second point one. here that I'll preface by saying this isn't a substantive criticism of Cincinnati or its ba- basketball program. I think this is a good team who I, really hope could do enough with this remaining schedule, get into the field of 68. Um, I like the fan base generally too. I like that you, what you tweeted, Dustin, that this game is now a big 12 matchup. I'll just say this. I don't know what Wes Miller's deal is, but I don't like it. His tucked in shirts, his little pouty facial expressions, getting a technical after a completely correct call and then putting himself in a position where he couldn't are like, there were some calls in the second half where if I was Wes Miller, I would not have been thrilled about it. Yep. And he couldn't argue it because he got a stupid tech like less than 10 minutes into the game. Just like the, the like the little collapse and the pouty faces. It's like Mick Cronin with like less juice, which again, is just like a really tough thing. Again, not a real criticism. It's it just a, a stupid little observation that I'm saying at the very end of our talk about the game, because it's much less important than everything that I think the three of us have talked about prior, but that that's I, it. I, I'm sorry. I do kind of, I do kind of see Wes Miller as like, what if uh, Mick Cronin was a little younger and tried a little too hard? Exactly. Mick, Mick Cronin just, without Mick Cronin's actual like success as a college head coach. It's like uh, uh, Step Brothers when he's like, I just want to punch you in your face. And he's like, is there anything I can do about that? Nope. It's just your face. <laughs> it's like, all right. All right. Sure. all right. That's all I got, guys. All right. All right. So uh, up next for the Houston Cougars, two home games against uh, two teams that Houston played to a dead heat in the closing seconds on the road, starting with a uh, home match versus UT Austin on Saturday, the Cougars will, of course, uh, be looking to complete the season sweep of the Longhorns after already beating them up in Austin, a 76-72 final in overtime. Uh, The Longhorns, one of only five teams on the year to score at least one full point per possession against Houston in a game, but nobody has yet done so in the Fertitta Center. Uh, Max Acemas and Dylan Mitchell were especially impressive at getting and making quality shots in that first matchup. Curious to see what the Cougars are going to do against them this time around. But I think either way, you know, this is still a good offensive Longhorn team. I think Houston should expect to have to score some points. Uh, Shed, Sharp, Cryer, and Roberts all had 13 plus in Austin. And uh, I think my ideal is seeing a a kind of similar offensive balance against a team that, you know, I think Houston will do better defensively, but you're still going to have to, you're still going to have to score some points to beat this team. Yeah, absolutely. I think, like you said, you are going to have to put up some points now. One thing that gives me, like, gets me a little excited about the about that is we just played a really good defensive team in Cincinnati. Still put up 68, 67, 68, sorry. It just, like, slipped my mind all of a sudden. Um, and we had some stretches, and we looked good in Austin, and playing at the Fertitta Center is very tough. As much as Big 12 Twitter wants to give us a hard time about our fan base and all this kind of stuff, the Cougs just show up. The Cougs just show up at Fertitta Center. And if we played you close on the road at your place, it's going to be interesting to see how they can bring it back to to Houston and, and still have the same performance that they had before. So uh, very exciting. Hope we get the sweep. Um, but like you said, they're the, one of the only schools that, that have gotten one point per possession, but doing it in the Fertitta Center is a different beast. So I am pretty excited and hopefully the Cougs can pull this one off. Yeah, there's still kind of a weird enigma, enigma hard to say than I thought, yeah. of a team. Uh, I think if you want some good comps about how the Longhorns have done against U of H like teams, they played four teams besides the uh, the Cougs. Well, against four teams, excuse me, four teams including the Cougs in the Ken Palm National Top Hundred. Currently, they're one in three in those games with a one win coming at home over Baylor and a Tyrese Hunter make. I think it was at the buzzer, Dustin. Do I remember that right? I'm, do you say? Do you mean top ten? I think you said top hundred. I think they throw more than four. I meant top twenty, actually. I don't top know why 20? I said uh, top uh, <laughs> top hundred. Uh, I'm sorry. I, that, I was so distracted by that. I, I was not paying attention. I did not. I did not hear the question that you asked. Uh, reset. 
Ken Palm national top 20 teams there, one and three against them, uh, including the previous game in Austin. Against the Cougars, the one win was a very close one. I believe a Tyrese Hunter make it the buzzer against Baylor. At home, Dustin, I figure if any one of the three of us had potentially like tuned in for that, it would have been you. Either way, a very late make. If you go for the entire season, uh, they're one and five against those teams, which including uh, non-conference losses to uh, UConn and Marquette. Uh, they also lost to a bad West Virginia team about a month ago in Morgantown, though, to be fair, Kansas did uh, as well. It doesn't mean they're incapable of winning the Fertitta Center. I mean, uh, when these teams played in Austin, it was clear that the Longhorns had a good plan for getting Max A. Smith shots. Dylan Mitchell, like you said, Dustin, had a monster game, which has kickstarted kind of a nice last four games for him. I think for me, the X factor of this one's going to be Dylan DeSue, whether the Cougars can keep him from putting up really nice offensive numbers. Uh, he had 14 against the Cougs, but did it maybe not the most efficient way possible in a close margin game. I think that really helped uh, his lowest point mar- point total in the last seven games was actually against the Cougs in Austin. You'll need him not to go off in this one. Do I think feel pretty comfortable at your chances of winning? And you may just play 13 games at the Fertitta Center to date. The closest margin of win guys. What do you think that is? All season. I I, I had a surprisingly oh, hard time. 15, like, like UCF, right? That's that's it. Mm-hmm. UCF by 15. Yep. I think this game will be closer than that. But I do think the Cougars will win this way. I, I do like the Cougars' chances at home, even though the Longhorns have been kind of hot and cold. They've been pretty cold at home, but they've had some I think, nice, nice road results. But I would still say those nice road results came against opponents who were a cut below the Cougars, with all respect to Oklahoma and TCU, both teams are projected in the field of 68, but I don't think I'm being unfair in saying that those teams are a tier below U of H, at least in the current season. So not taking the Longhorns lightly here. I hope it's a really good crowd for Tita Center, but I think the Cougars can get the, se- the regular season sweep in this one. Yeah, if you hold to DeSue, something, DeSue to something like 14 points on inefficient yeah. shooting, like that's, you take that. That's what you got to do. That's yeah. the that's <laughs> the blueprint. You're not holding them to six or something. Like, so you're not that kind of player. Um, but yeah, no, the other, only other thing for me that I'm going to be real interested in is, uh, just forcing turnovers. You know, this is a UT team that on the year has been a little bit sloppy with the ball. Uh, only, uh, 10 turnovers was Houston able to force in 45 minutes uh, up in Austin. Um, the Longhorns turned around and immediately had much worse turnover games against TCU and Iowa state in their next two games. So hoping to see that, uh, in the Fertitta center be more of a factor Houston, I think they may be being a little bit more aggressive uh, defensively with uh, with the home crowd behind them. So uh, we got that game. And then just two days later, uh, Houston will be hosting Iowa State on Monday evening. Obviously, a revenge game for Houston after taking the loss up in Ames and a huge game for the Big 12 title race. I, Iowa State, as I mentioned earlier, uh, playing uh, TCU or at Cincinnati, rather, as we speak, up eight at the half. Um, but uh, coming into today, the only Big 12 team besides Houston with only one conference loss. So very good chance that these teams are either like tied for first or one of them is in first and then one's, you know, a game back, something like that when they face off on Monday. And this is an Iowa State that's, uh, Iowa State team that's playing really good ball right now after losing by a bunch in Provo. They've won five of their last six. The only loss coming on the road at Baylor by two points. That streak includes road wins at TCU and UT Austin and a home win over Kansas so you know what I think could be a crucial x factor guys for this one is that yes this is two games in three days for both teams but it's two home games in three days for Houston Iowa State plays in Ames on Saturday and then has to be in Houston on Monday not a real easy turnaround so uh you know with that and you know the revenge factor here for Houston wanting to uh to make right their uh their loss the first time around um I'd like to think that Houston has a a good chance with this one uh, coming at home Yeah, I would just say, um, you know, a matchup I'm really excited about because I think if nothing else, between now and when these teams last matched up previously, I think Iowa State's really shown themselves to be not just like a good right side of the bubble level team, but a team genuinely in the hunt to win the conference regular season title right now, a team that's top 10 right now in net and Ken Palm in the polls. Mm, What'd you say? No, sorry, I was saying and the AP polls. I you were taking a dramatic pause and you were already getting there on your own. My bad. Um. And again, this is an opponent who I think barring complete collapse, and I'm sorry if this ends up being a jinx on your team of second allegiance, Dustin, I think we're talking about a team I'm really confident is not going to have a number lower than four next to their name come Selection Sunday. Again, I think one of the very small number of teams out there, you could say, create more havoc defensively than the Cougars. The Cyclones lead the Big 12 in steal percentage uh, right ahead of the Cougars, top 75 nationally in block percentage as well. 
I don't think the clones are as good at forcing misses as the Cougs, but I think when you force as much chaos as they do, it really does even things out. And we saw it play out in Ames uh, when Iowa State started out in that 14-0 run, and it felt like the Cougars were kind of playing in a hole the rest of that game. I think really the head of the snake, the tip of the spear, whatever you want to call it defensively, is that combo of Tame and Lipsy and Keyshawn Gilbert. Uh, both guys can also create with the ball in their hands to differing degrees as well. Lipsy is fifth in the country in steal rate. Keyshawn Gilbert's top 75 in free throw rate on a team that has been really good at getting to the charity stripe. I, I don't think any one player has been better at that than Gilbert this season. And that's going to be the big challenge, I think, for the Cougs in this one, not letting Iowa State win this one at the line, or I guess more specifically doing what you need to do on the offensive end to take advantage of, you know, the team in the Cougs that fouls a fair amount. I think it also behooves the Cougars to uh, to do what they need to do to take advantage of a cycling team that, like them, also, I think it plays a, plays a physical brand of defense that often lends itself to uh, sending an opponent to the free throw line a fair amount. And I think another challenge is going to be doing a better job on Milan Momchilovic. I mean, he's not a 20-plus points a night guy yet in his career, but he's a six foot eight matchup problem. He hit, I think, basically the deciding shot when these teams last met previously. And you noted it, Dustin, the quick turnaround between uh, U of H's Saturday game and this one, Iowa State coming off uh, hosting Texas Tech and then coming all the way to Houston. This game in a lot of ways, I mean, this most complimentary way possible, really reminds me of the U of H Cincy games the last couple of years Mick Cronin was there in the American in that both of these teams are two really tough uh, defensively minded outfits who can play rock fighty basketball and has serious conference title implications. I think as someone who really enjoys that kind of basketball, I can't wait for Monday night guys. Yeah, it's going to be a super exciting game. Um, I think the key for U of H is going to be scoring more, obviously, right? But scoring with more people, right? You look at the the first matchup, Manuel Sharp leads with 20. Jamal Shedd has 14. And then everyone else had 19 combined. You're going to have to see somebody other than those two. I mean, uh, uh, Francis had three. Wani only had six um, on three of seven shooting. So it's just going to be can you get more scoring than what you got in the first game? I mean, kind of looking back at the box score, I thought U of H shot terribly in that game. They shot the exact same as Iowa State. So like you said, Sam, it is a knockdown drag out defensive game. We just had one of those. And this one's going to be a ton of fun to watch. Hopefully the Cougs can get the revenge. But the thing I'm looking for is can we get more scoring, more depth scoring than we did the last time? If you can hold Iowa State to 62 Right, you held them to 57 last time and still lost. If you can hold them to 62, I don't see the Cougs not getting over that number. So it's going to be, can you keep Iowa State where they were and can you get more scoring than you got the last game? And I think starting uh, with a bucket in the first 10 minutes, unlike what we had the first game, would uh, would would certainly help that. I was going to say, the loss up in Ames was really about two things for me. It was about the slow start and it was about the turnovers. It was... Iowa State having a double-digit lead after about five seconds and Houston just kind of, you know, chopping away at it the rest of the way and only kind of barely catching up, you know, just in time to tie it up and then lose on a, a heartbreaking, almost buzzer, buzzer beater there by uh, Momchilovich. Um, and then also Houston committing an uncharacteristic 16 turnovers. That's mm-hmm. and obviously a big part of that is, like Sam said, Iowa State's as good as anybody in the country at uh, forcing turnovers. But, um, you know, we saw this Houston team could turnovers en masse in the first half, turnovers that seemingly every critical juncture as they tried to rally throughout the game. And this is still, like I said, it's, it's, it's a damn good Iowa state team and they're still as good as anybody at forcing turnovers. But with this game, again, coming in the friendly confines of the Fertitta center with Kelvin Sampson, having seen what Iowa state did to his team the first time and getting to, to coach them up in, in before the, uh, the rematch, I just, again, is Houston going to have six turnovers in this game? No, they'll probably have more than that, but I don't think it's going to be the, uh, the 16 that they had last time either. Yeah. I have a hard time believing Jamal Shedd's going to have five turnovers again. That's just not what he does. Like, let's just be honest. Jamal Shedd's is not a guy who turns the ball over like that. And we had uncharacteristic turnovers. We had passes that were not even to a target. We had uh, one or two 10 seconds, right? We saw a little bit of pressure from Iowa State, and we had a couple of 10 seconds. Um, just like uncharacteristic. Again, we're not going to have six. That's a great point, Dustin. But I don't know if we're going to have 16. And I just don't see Jamal Shedd coming out, putting up five turnovers again. And Jamal's... Uh, turnovers felt like they all came early. Like once the Cougs kind of settled down in that game, we started to chip away at it, but we never got settled in. And that was one of our first big, uh, big 12 atmospheres. 
it was a it was a crazy rambunctious crowd so first time everyone not named lj cryer was playing in that building yeah so so I, I just feel like it's going to be a little bit different and that building has some weird voodoo about it and uh and so yeah i just i don't if if the kooks just clean it up it's not even that they need to shoot better or they need to they just need to clean everything up a little bit get a little better on the margins and that could be the difference in this game yeah i was gonna say like that you guys kind of mentioned it but we talk a lot about how this team is so good at forcing turnovers, but kind of overlooked is how good they've been at taking care of the ball outside of the game against Iowa state. So yeah, <laughs> very, very critical to success. Top 10 on top 10 matchup yet. The big ESPN Monday night game guys, this is the stage. This program has deserved. Yep. Absolutely. This is why you joined the big 12. Yep. All right, guys, that's it for men's hoops. Let's uh, before we get into all the other in season sports, let's do our final, our final season preview of the 2023, 24 athletic season cougar baseball as always the last ones to get going and like cougar softball this is another program that isn't super far removed from uh, having success but is far enough removed that there's some clear pressure to get this team back to the ncaa postseason uh you'll remember the five-year stretch from 2014 to 2018 houston went to four regionals hosted two of them went to a super regional won three aac regular season titles and two tournament titles uh, unfortunately, in the five seasons since then, Houston has been to zero regionals and won zero conference titles of any kind. Um, and the good news is that after bottoming out in 2021, the last two seasons have been respectable, going 37 and 24 overall two years ago, 36 and 23, including a 17 and six mark in the American Athletic Conference, which which used to mean something. Damn it, it used to mean something if you went 17 and six in the American, but unfortunately, that conference. Uh, has been devolving into a pretty mediocre baseball conference and Houston's non-conference strength. The schedule the last couple of years has not nearly uh, been enough to uh, do its part to make up the difference. So even those uh, relatively nice win totals uh, were not enough to have Houston in any kind of consideration for a regional in either year. And one thing I can say with confidence, guys, uh, if Houston wins 36 or 37 games this year, their strength of schedule isn't going to keep them out of a regional. The Big 12 will uh, we'll see to that. Um, tough conference. Houston was picked ninth in the official Big 12 preseason poll. Uh, D1 Baseball picked Houston eighth and said that the conference would get uh, seven bids. So I think there is a perception that, that the Cougars will, will once again be kind of like wrong side of the bubble or just outside of bubble consideration as they have been the last two years. And I think this team, like we're, we're going to talk about, it. this team absolutely has a chance. This team has the pieces to make a regional and prove people wrong. I think it's also totally fair for outside observers to be in believe it when I see it mode with this team. D1 baseball have them, you know, keep an eye on T or whatever. But I mean, heck, I'm a huge fan. The first Cougar sporting event I ever went to was a Cougar baseball game. I followed this team to dozens of stadiums and I am in believe it when I see it mode with this, uh, with this team. So I think it's uh, it's fair, even with a lot of talent on this roster and a lot of, I think potential reasons to be optimistic. I think it's fair that the, the perception is still like, okay, you got, you got to go prove it now that you're, you're back to the NCAA postseason. You know, I wanted to add something here. I, I promise this actually connects to Cougar Baseball. I remember this is back in 2017, Dustin. Uh, we were respectively the best man and a groomsman at a wedding of uh, some dear friends of ours, uh, one of whom is a uh, a Cougar alum uh, during the 2017 regional that U of H was hosting. And I was able to catch the last couple of games, but I remember almost not going and thinking to myself, well, we're going to be in these regularly enough that, you know, I guess I can miss this year and, you know, in the seven years since then, we've only been to one since, none of them at the University of Houston. You know, I, I, I didn't have gray hairs in my beard back then I do now. That's how long it's been since we've made the NCAA postseason. And, and there are reasons to feel positively about what this team could be. I, th- I think you listed them off, you know, the most general terms. They were to talk about some players that I think we're very positive on. There's a case to be made. This team isn't going back to the NCAA postseason, but I am like you. And I, I, I would guess I'm like Bobby as well. I am now firmly in believe it when I see it mode. And I, I think this team has some interesting pieces. I also think this team has a lot of the same questions that the past several weren't able to ultimately answer and ended up being a big part of the reason why those teams didn't end up being close to NCAA caliber because really it's not as if like, oh, you've been getting on the bubble and getting really close. I mean, the 2019 team, I will, I will give Todd Wooden credit, was I think unfairly excluded from the postseason field that year. You haven't really been that close any year since then even though I, I would agree with you that the team has certainly after pretty much bottoming out in 2021 been noticeably better. And I think noticeably more watchable these last two seasons, you were an NCAA team these past season. I think when Todd came on with us during the summer, he said, 
the team had to win some crazy amount of games. It was like what 45 or 46 against last year's schedule to be postseason caliber. I mean, just like hasn't hasn't really been there. And that I think has been a program that if not in the tournament every year, has been in the tournament in the postseason quite often. It just hasn't happened recently. So I think that's some of the same questions, but I think also still some reasons for optimism. I'm not going into this uh fully negative. I'm I'm more positive this week than I was for a lot of the softball preview. I, I will say that. Yeah, absolutely. I I can't add much to what you guys are saying. It definitely is prove it, prove it mode. We've heard the the words and the hype and the preseason talk year after year. And it's kind of one of those things where you see it and you do have that optimism. You do see what happened last year and you're going, okay, this, this team's going to be, if, if they can build on this, they're going to do something. And it, the next logical step is you bottomed out in 2021. You got slightly better in 2022, slightly better in 23. It's now time for you to make the tournament in 2024. And we thought maybe last year was that moment where, hey, we're going to, you know, the pitching's here, the the hitting's here, everything's where we want it, and we, we're going to get excited a little bit. And then it just didn't happen, and so now it's that, it's that cautioned optimism where you're like, yeah, I could see it happening this year, but I could have also seen it happen last year, and I, I got my heart broken. And I don't want to watch until we, until we see it now, uh, you know, the three of us are going to watch no matter what, because we're sickos. Uh, but at the end of the day, it, it is, you are more optimistic than you are pessimistic about this, this team, but just keeping it, you're going, all right, I want to see what we can actually do first. I think that's a great way to describe it. Yeah, and we'll start with uh, discussing this year's team by talking about the pitching staff. And really the story of Houston's decline over the past five years has been the story of Todd Whitting's inability to replace Frank Anderson, a pitching coach. Anderson was the hire of the century when Whitting got him, uh, but he's been the pitching coach at Tennessee now since 2017. And uh, Terry Rooney got uh, four years, I guess, really, to be fair, we'll give him three years with COVID to prove that he wasn't the answer. Uh, and then Kyle Bunn was out after a so-so year one turned into a pretty disastrous year two on at least in terms of the pitching aspect last year. So hopefully the third time uh, is the charm and that Sean Kenny is the guy. We talked about Kenny back when Whitty made the move, but the very in a nutshell version is that he's certainly had some good staffs in the past and his last job was an SEC one. But the other side of that is that his admittedly very injury ravaged staff got clobbered last year and that's why he was on the market. So um, hopefully his, you know, kind of reputation with the industry quote unquote is, uh, is deserved. And I think the big test for him, at least the biggest test for me in terms of how good of a uh, pitching coach is Sean Kenny is I'm really curious to see what Paul Schmitz looks like this year. Uh, the big six, eight German, uh, righty was a little up and down, like you ex- expect from a, uh, a freshman who just moved to the States last year, but, uh, showed a lot of potential. Um, and I, I think if, if Kenny is kind of, you know, the, 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 as good a pitching coach as, as Whitting says, or as quote unquote people in the industry say, then uh, I'd really like to see that in terms of, uh, you know, I, 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 I'd give him a lot of credit if Paul Schmitz has a, a breakout sophomore a season here. Definitely looking for that to uh, hopefully happen. I just want to add also, I think what gives me a bit more positivity is U of H brought in uh, former MLB pitcher, uh, former college assistant and Cougar alum, uh, Woody Williams is the director of pitching strategy and development. He was most recently the pitching coach at UT Austin last season where they were top 10 nationally in team ERA or the top uh, ERA team in the big 12, but uh, let go of Williams after the horns failed to make the college world series because that they just push the fire button. Whenever the team doesn't <laughs> almost win a championship uh, pretty much across the board uh, in all sports before that, he was a really successful assistant coach at uh, San Jack uh, noted Juco baseball power. You know, I don't know the ins and outs of who will do what, but I just like adding Williams to the brain trust. And I want to start kind of talking about the guys who we expect to be, in the weekend rotation, uh, Jackson Jelkin is a name that we've heard a lot uh, from the fall. A guy who wasn't on the roster last season, pitched at uh, South Mountain Community College uh, in the Phoenix Metro last year. Had really good strikeout numbers, was good enough to be a 14th round draft pick, but elected to roll at U of H. And uh, basically every written thing I think we've consumed about U of H baseball in the offseason has talked about him being a top of the rotation guy. So wouldn't be surprised if he's the guy who takes the mound on Friday night. And the other guy I want to mention is someone Dustin already touched on, Paul Schmitz, uh, was really your most effective starter last year. That's that's a low bar, but I think it was a really impressive season. It wasn't a huge number of innings pitch because he missed a lot of the uh, the back half of the season. Hurt, or I think just resting out of uh, precaution uh, because of an injury. 
but to go from to go from playing European baseball, whatever that exists as now, to American Division One, and to be a college team's most effective starter, I think that's really impressive, and it's just kind of a uh, exciting to think about what he could be after a couple more seasons playing American college competition. I, I think that's that's gonna be really cool, and I think you know, the question is like who's gonna be the third guy, probably alongside of uh, Jelkin and Schmitz in that weekend rotation. Yeah, yeah. for me, Jel- oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, oh, you, Bobby. Go ahead. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. You you pointed out name uh, Jackson Jelkin. He's somebody that we should be really excited about. One of the big uh, things with Frank Anderson was he ten- he tended to tell his pitchers to pound the strike zone, right? And we have seen that kind of disappear from U of H once once Frank left. And you know you kind of look at you kind of look at Jackson's uh, stats. Led led his uh, community college um, in strikeouts per nine, eleven point six six. So. Gotta love that. Uh, 11 strikeouts per nine innings, 98 strikeouts over seven, 75 and two thirds innings. Love that as well with a 3.8. Um, going to be interested to see how he transfers that into division one, but you know, pounding the strike zones, pounding the strike zone, no matter which, uh, no matter what level you're playing. in. so really excited to, to kind of see how he is, uh, what's, what's going to happen with him uh, on, on Friday, Saturdays, or even Sundays, wherever they, wherever they put him. I want to mention yeah. real quick also, I was going to say, like, uh, pitch it in Nebraska as well. So isn't his yep. first uh, time against D1 competition? Sorry, Dustin. No, I was going to say a couple other guys that I think have the potential to join the weekend rotation alongside um, uh, Schmitz and uh, Angelkin. Uh, Alabama transfer Antoine Jean, um, another newcomer, uh, started 16 games for uh, the Crimson Tide over three years, had a career ERA of 351 and, you know, easily the toughest conference in baseball. I uh, didn't play any last year. I don't know if there's an injury or something going on there, but if he looks, yeah, he was, I checked, like, he was hurt. Yeah. So, but if he looks something like his previous self, you'd think he could be a, a, a big contributor. And then, and, you know, another guy who's, I guess, technically a returner because he was on the roster before, but didn't really play much last year. Uh, that's Kyle Acalameto, uh, the big left. He was expected to be a bell cow in the weekend rotation for Houston last year after showing uh, some promise the year before in his first year at a Juco ball. And he looked really good through uh, six innings over two starts last year. Uh, but unfortunately, that's how much work he got in before suffering a season ending injury. So like Jean, if either of those guys is back to, 100%. They feel like they could slot in as that, you know, third guy in the weekend rotation. Maybe one of them is the your Sunday guy. Maybe one of them is your Tuesday guy, something like that. Um, but, you know, I, I think some options up front. And then I think definitely some some options in the uh, the back end of the bullpen. Two-way guy, uh, Justin Murray, was awesome in that department last year, and he's back. Uh, Jose Torrealba, who the parallels to the Calamato Southpaw, showed promise two years ago, first year at a Juco. And then got injured early last year, takes a red shirt and comes back. But this, you know, Tori Alba probably more likely to be in the pen, I think, whereas the Calamento may be, uh, may be more likely to get some starts. Uh, Owen Woodward, pretty respectable in relief last year. He's back. Um, and then another guy, Chris Stewart, I'm really intrigued by, was a, a stud at San Jack. Went to uh, Austin last year, pitched for the Longhorns at 18 Ks and 15 innings pitched up there. Um, and then comes now to uh, to the Cougs with a decent amount of promise. And then Alex Salise, a pretty highly rated freshman, something Houston hasn't gotten a ton of lately. I'm hopeful uh, he can contribute early on as well. So a lot of, I know, like, I don't want to be mean, but I do feel like our head coach says that this is his deepest pitching staff, like, every year for the last, like, six years. It's not mean if it's true. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean it's not true, but I mean, you know, it's a, it's a lot of guys that have to kind of go out there and prove it still. Um, but I think a lot of potential and, and I think, you know, we're going to certainly give Sean Kenny uh, the chance to kind of prove his metal and, and prove his paycheck and, and turn a lot of these, you know, talented guys into uh, even more productive uh, college pitchers. Yeah. I was just going to say, I could see scenarios where this is a much deeper and more effective pitching staff for all, all the guys you just said to us, but I could also see us uh, in like four months coming right back here and be like, yeah, you were more reliable pitching away from potentially really being a serious uh, and so a tournament team. Like I could, I could absolutely see both happening. And what I was saying earlier was no, it's not you saying that is not mean if it's true because we I've seen it in every D one baseball fall report for the last like six years. So no, I mean yeah, I agree. he he hypes up that staff, and this is the year we're gonna pound the zone. This is the year we're gonna get lots of strikeouts. This is the year where we have a team ERA of two point two, and uh, it just again it's the theme of the seat of the, of the year is prove it. We can see on paper how it makes sense that this is going to happen, how you can get there. I can understand how you're going to say, this is one of my deepest pitching rotations that I've had since I've been here. Prove it. 
And kind of like we talked about with softball, you know, we sure hope the pitching staff can pitch because this lineup looks like they're gonna be able to hit again. You know, this Mm -hmm. team has shown a lot of promise at the plate the last two years. We've seen two consecutive seasons of Houston improving in basically every offensive category, team batting average, extra base hits, homers, stolen bases, walks, hits per game, runs per game. All of those categories have increased two years in a row. Uh, Last year, Houston scored 7.36 runs per game, their highest total since the gorilla ball era of the late nineties. And in terms of returnees, first baseman, Justin Murray is the guy you got to start with hit 379 with 11 home runs, led the team in RBIs and slugging percentage last year. Just a huge bat in the lineup in addition to his aforementioned uh, late inning pitching expertise. So, um, I mean, Bobby, for me, getting him back for the 2024 season was the biggest recruiting coup that that Whitting and staff pulled off uh, this offseason. Yeah, you can't replace that, right? That that doesn't just come in and that kind of production doesn't just show up and – you know, it's not that, you know, you lose it and then you're like, oh, we just slot this new guy in and it does it perfectly. I think keeping him is equivalent of, like you said, bringing in a five-star recruit uh, between his hitting and his pitching. It's just an absolute coup to be able to keep him on this, uh, keep him on the roster. Yeah, I mean, chief among the reasons to be excited about the lineup, to have him as your locked on starter at first base. And he came in last year from Dartmouth off a really good all Ivy League kind of season. So Maybe it was a bit less surprised that he was a standout hitter. He, he'd been kind of a, with all respect to him as a college athlete, he'd been kind of a mediocre, like, innings eater guy on the mound. For him to come in and be your best hitter and your most reliable pitcher while being a plus defender, like, just, I think the only thing Justin Murray didn't do at Cougar baseball games last year was sell the popcorn. Like, incredible. I think among the very best of the, you know, two-way guys this program's had, and there's been a number of very good two-way guys that have come to this program in its history, I think certainly your best since the glory days of Rainer Noble in the late nineties and early two thousands, when you kind of more regularly had guys doing what Justin Murray did. And that 2023 season is a really hard act to follow, but I mean, anything close to what he did last year against big 12 competition, I think is really, really impressive. I would say the second biggest reason to be excited about is another a returner, your third year starting catcher, super senior Anthony Tulomero. I mean, his average dropped a bit from 2022, but Still had double-digit home runs, was third on the team in ribbies behind Murray, and then now uh, playing in the pros, Zach Arnold, while also being a plus defender behind the plate. I remember he came in from Kansas with a good defensive rep, and it was kind of just like, okay, well, let's see what this guy can do hitting-wise, and he's been such a plus for you offensively these last two seasons, and I'm really excited to see what he does in his final college season as well. Yeah, I don't know that he was a plus defender. I think he might have been a plus-plus defender. You might have to give him two pluses, to be fair. He is so good behind the plate. <laughs> And yeah, I mean, his batting average did drop from 326 to 267 last year, but I know I, I was reading somewhere recently that he apparently he was real banged up. I think like I had like a wrist thing that was just not really right all the year last year. So, and he, despite that hit for more power, hit for 10 home runs after hitting for five his uh, his first season yeah. at U of H. So if he's healthy heading into this year, I mean, I think he is someone, him and, uh, and Murray both are, are guys that could easily, I could see making an all big 12 team this season other returnees to like uh, outfielder Cameron Nickens is back after hitting uh, just under 300 as a freshman and hitting 310 last year as a sophomore you know he's got enough size I'd like to think he can maybe you know get a little even a little more pop this year or that or maybe increase his walk rate would turn him into a really dangerous hitter uh, Alex Lopez another veteran returnee pesky lefty hitter who hit uh, over 300 uh, two years ago before dipping a bit last year and then Thomas Lissy is someone that the staff got 54 ABs for as a freshman last year and uh, and then in the fall, Whitting pointed to him as someone who he thought was really ready for a big sophomore leap and thought could play a, a strong defensive third base. So um, in terms of the returnees, those those five guys, I think, are, are, are the five that that I would really see slotting into the lineup. And and maybe not all five of them, because there are enough uh, incomers incoming. Uh, there's enough incoming talent that you imagine that even those five, aside from probably Tulamero and Murray, are probably even going to have to uh, to battle for uh, for A.B.'s. Yeah, it's a great problem to have, right? Too many good players. It's never it's never a bad thing when you look at your roster and you go, how are we going to fit all these good players on the field at one time? I was going to add, there's the newcomer I'm really excited about. Uh, Cougars dipping into the uh, promising guy who played for a uh, smaller Northeast program well for a second straight year, the same well that got you Justin Murray and bringing in uh, Jake Reynas, who uh, most recently played at Maine, will be playing his fifth college season this year. Uh, last year at 321 with 16 homers. Stole 38 bases while playing a premium defensive position shortstop. And well, and noted that stolen bases stat because really outside of Justin Murray, a lot of your top base dealers from last year are no longer here. And I think 
anyone defensively is going to be a step down from the guy who Reyes is replacing Ian McMillan. But I really like what I've read about Reyes. I really like his, uh, his career things so far. And you see a lot of guys from their fourth to fifth season make this big jump. Uh, like just, again, your development when you're between 18 and 23 years old can be, could be pretty large from like one year to the next. Unfortunately, the three of us, I think have, have aged out of the, the physical development uh, years of our lives. But like when you're in college and you're playing a fifth year, which hasn't always been the case, you know, with COVID kind of throwing eligibility uh, a little crazy here the last several years, I, I'm excited to see if this guy has like a big step in him. If nothing else, I think, I think he'll give you a, a solid option at shortstop where for the first time in a great number of years, you're not going to see in McMillan out there on opening day. Yeah. And just yeah. one more, um, I'm, I'm, one more name to just kind of throw out there because, you know, as you read fall reports and previews of this team, uh, big time uh, college baseball guy, for anyone who doesn't know, Kendall Rogers is is one of the top names in uh, college baseball uh, journalism. Uh, Alex Lopez, he seems very high on Alex Lopez. Alex Lopez hit 270. You know, the stats don't jump out. 276 homers, 34 RBIs. But apparently in the scrimmage between uh, Houston and Texas A&M, he was just absolutely out there killing it so uh plays a lot of different positions can pretty much go wherever you need to so um if he's not an everyday starter should be interesting to just kind of you know you don't have to fall back too much on a on a guy you know you have a guy who can come in and uh, still hit be productive and won't necessarily you know he can fill in for anybody somebody gets banged up or somebody just needs a day look for alex lopez to be a a depth guy who's going to come in and really just not have a massive fall off between him and the uh, the starter. Yeah, he's he was a mostly every game starter the last couple of seasons. Yeah, he so was. I, I, ex- he I was. expect it to be the same this year. Yeah. Sam, you mentioned Reynas coming in uh, from Maine, likely to be the uh, starting shortstop, but he's really one of, and he's I think the one that's getting the most headlines and the one I'm most excited about. But he's one of three guys that is coming to Houston after just hitting the absolute crap out of the ball in smaller conferences last year. Tristan Moore did so for New Orleans. Trey Jones did so for AM Corpus. Those are two guys that are coming in after putting some pretty good numbers up in smaller conferences and guys that are kind of veterans and you think, you know, might have the, uh, the tools to, uh, to, to do some impressive stuff at the higher level. And then you've got a trio of guys coming in who played smaller roles for sec teams, uh, Harold Cole coming from Arkansas, Jonathan French coming from uh, South Carolina by way of Clemson and then Hudson Sapp coming in from Ole Miss, uh, three guys that may be, you know, ready to, uh, to step into bigger roles after coming out of what is, you know, just clearly the, uh, the best conference in college baseball. Um, and then a couple other names that I'm interested in. Freshman Ace Reese is someone that D1 Baseball has been talking up quite a bit in some of their reports. You don't get too many freshman hitters. Would love to see, you know, if there's anyone that, that's able to come in and hit right away, get some A-Bs as a freshman, maybe that's Reese. Uh, and then Joey Craig, who hit 18 homers at the JUCO level last year, the D1 Baseball Fall Report, said he looks real good defensively playing center field. So if you got a, you know, solid solid defensive center fielder that can hit with some pop, you don't, uh, you don't hate that for sure. So, right. you know. Even if none of the other returnees or newcomers that didn't pop up on my radar, you know, even if none of them pan out, like we literally just mentioned 13 guys that like, I wouldn't bat an eye at them, like being in the starting lineup for this team, being a good, you know, a decent to good or very good uh, starting player for a big 12 team. So really excited to see who the staff runs out there and and see what the Cougars can do, uh, you know, with the sticks this year. Two quick points here. One, one, uh, one off field, uh, but Trey Jones, did a uh, electric guitar national anthem uh, before a U of H oh, men's yeah. basketball game. That was so, that was so good. I'm not just saying that because he's a baseball player. It, it was just like a, wow, that was pretty good. And I discovered he's U of H baseball player. I was like, wow, this guy's good enough to play that kick-ass national anthem and be a division one baseball player. That's, that's really cool. I, I was just gonna what am I doing with my life? <laughs> exactly. Right. Can't, can't do anything. Remotely he's great at two things. Cool. I'm good at zero. Damn yeah, it. Right. Uh, <laughs> glad you mentioned Joey Craig does. I'm really excited to see how, you know, that, that bad and 18 homers at a pretty high Juco league, how that translates to, uh, to D one ball. And I think replacing kind of like Ian McMillan, a, uh, a really plus defender and drew Bianco, but maybe you could upgrade the bat a bit there. Yeah. Looking at the, uh, the schedule, uh, you know, for non-conference schedule thoughts, I don't think we're going to spend a whole lot of time on it because if you're looking for interesting non-conference opportunities for Houston, it's pretty limited. Uh, <laughs> in this, in the staff's defense, there's only four non-conference series that they get to play with. And, One of them is like that weird one in late April because of there's an odd number of big 12 teams, baseball teams. You have to take a weird week off in the middle of the season. So, uh, you know, and you're in a really good baseball conference now. So it's not like you want to kill yourself in non-conference too. Uh, But that being said of Houston's 26 
non-conference games this year. Only seven are against teams that finished in the top 100 of the RPI last year. Uh, you've got the midweek three, the three midweek games against Sam Houston, the Don Sanders Cup. They finished 74th. Now you've got the event at Minute Maid where Houston will play Vandy, Texas State, and Louisiana Lafayette, one elite team and two very solid ones. And then they'll have a Tuesday night in College Station in April against the Aggies. That's it. That's that is it for teams that were even in the top hundred of the RPI last year. So, you know, that I'm really excited for that Minute Maid event. That's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, definitely gonna, you know keep a close eye on that one. And, and, you know, the chance to play Vandy is a really uh, big opportunity, obviously for Houston, uh, especially in a major league park there. But yeah, other than that, it's going to be a whole lot of teams that you go, Oh, please don't lose to this team. Please. Uh, this has got to be a W this has got, this is the quad three quad four games that you just got to be, uh, you got to be taken care of. So that's, that's part of the, you know, obviously they don't count as much as, as the weekend series do, but you got, you know, you got three weekend series against teams that you need to absolutely, uh, take care of business in those games as well. So going to be a lot of games that Houston just kind of gets tested in the sense of needing to be consistently good and consistently beating some of these uh, lower teams too, uh, because you're not going to get a whole lot of easy wins uh, in the big 12. I was going to say at one time, this century St. John's was a good Northeast baseball power. That has not been any time recent when I was doing my research in the show, which I was uh, sad to find out. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, uh, the non-conference, like you said, Dustin, not, Super exciting, but as we're about to talk, the conference is exciting. So, yeah, and when you look at the Big 12, uh, TCU heading into the season is the clear front runner in the Big 12. They got all but one of the first place votes from coaches besides their own, and they are number five in the D1 baseball and perfect game preseason national polls, number six in baseball America. Uh, the Longhorns are the expected number two, both in terms of the conference poll and also the national polls would have them as the next highest ranked big 12 team. I thought this was funny. Uh, Kansas state, Texas tech and Oklahoma state in the three major polls, each of them is in two of them. And then like each poll doesn't have one of the three of them, which I just, that was kind of amusing to me. Um, and then Oklahoma and West Virginia, not really getting top 25 love, but still projected regional teams. They are tied for sixth in the big season in the big 12 preseason poll. Funny enough, Houston skips this entire tier of the conference. These are the two teams Houston doesn't play. Like you're clear, you're clear, pretty clear cut, like top five. Houston plays all of them. You're pretty clear cut top, the bottom four. Houston plays all of them. You're like one team that's kind of like neck and neck with you. Houston plays them. The two teams that are just kind of right there, like regional good, but not top 25 good. And Houston misses both of them. Um, And then, you know, Kansas, like I said, uh, is, you know, kind of right next with Houston in some order, depending on if you believe the, uh, the conference poll or the D one baseball poll. And then both of them picked comfortably ahead of the other three newcomers as well as Baylor. So, you know, I think kind of a fairly balanced schedule for Houston, I guess, in that you don't miss any of the top teams, but you don't miss any of the bottom teams either. And you get one more uh, home series and you get on the road. So um, definitely a, uh, an intriguing test for Houston in terms of you got a combination of some series that you kind of have to win against uh, some of the lower teams and then you're, you know, you're playing, playing three games up in Fort Worth and you'd be, uh, you know, you'd bite someone's wrist off to get, uh, to get one win out of those three. Mm-hmm. That's a, br- uh, that, that was my, like my big schedule. And it was just like that stretch that, that you're alluding to uh, there is brutal. That, that is going to be, I think not saying you need to go like six and three against or anything like that, but not getting just absolutely brutalized by that portion of the schedule, I think is going to really make or break your postseason chances. If you can actually steal a few wins from that, like I think you actually start feeling pretty good about maybe having an at large case provided you, know, you took care of business prior to that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, I'm, I'm sorry. The, go ahead, Dustin. Go, 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 go. The positive way, to, the negative way to look at it is like, Oh man, you got five series against uh, like really, really good teams. You know, two of them on the road, three of them at home teams that are, you know, probably at least top 25 or borderline good. That, that's scary because that's a lot of good, tough teams. But then on the other side, it's all these opportunities where the losses aren't really going to hurt you that much and the wins are going to look real good in your resume. You know, just the games that you just weren't getting any of in the American in the way that just kind of choked out your your chances of ever you know, making the NCAA postseason. Yeah, it has, it, a very, nope. it has a very volleyball vibe to it, right? Like, um, even though volleyball went super tough in the, in the non-conference it just it just has that feel that like if you can take care if you can take care of business non conference and then look okay in conference play you have an argument depending on who your wins come up against uh you have an argument that you could be a that you could that you should be a tournament team I was just saying and for what it's worth 
you did do really well head to head last year against the one good AAC baseball team, ECU, is perennial top twenty five team. So, not saying not saying you're going to win one hundred percent of your games against these level opponents like you did against ECU last year. I mean, generally the last few years the head to head record against ECU isn't the best, but this team did have its moments against some better teams. Just like you said, Dustin, just not enough games where you had any chance of uh, beating a quality opponent, and not not a problem you'll have this year. Yeah. In terms of the home away, I think it kind of it breaks down pretty even for Houston. Uh, the four teams that are picked uh, comfortably beneath them, Houston has two of them at home, two of them on the road. Um, you know, the top two teams in the conference, TCU away, the Longhorns at home, and then that other, like, you know, top 25-ish teams, Houston gets Oklahoma State and Kansas State at home, Texas Tech away. So in terms of your home roads, but like I said, you get one more home series than, uh, than road. So not mad about that. Um, like I said, I would have loved to just like happen to, to miss TCU, but you know, again, like that's the trade off for getting, you know, to play all four of, uh, Cincinnati, BYU, UCF and Baylor. So excited to see Houston get into this again. It's a, it's a not, it's not men's basketball where you're like, oh, we're going to go in and be a threat to win it, you know, year one, but it's not soccer either. We are like, oh man, we're just holding on for dear life. It's, it's somewhere in the middle <laughs> right. where you, you're going to, you're going to have the series where you go, oh man, we need to get at least two out of three. And you're going to have the series where you go, oh man, I'd love to get one out of three. So it should be yeah. a very, a very compelling and and fun big 12 uh, season for the Cougars. Yeah. You have chances to build your resume, exactly. right? You get, you get two out of three versus one of the top tier teams. You get to build your resume off that. So you get a lot of opportunities to build your resume. And to your point, Dustin, not many where it's going to absolutely uh, tank your resume either. So looking at opening weekend, the Cougars will be hosting Binghamton. Uh, the Bearcats are the preseason favorites in the America East Conference. They finished 29 and 23 last year overall, good for 218th in the RPI. Uh, the only four power conference teams that they played last year was their first four games of the season when they got swept at Clemson and then lost a midweeker at Wake Forest. Only one of those four losses was close. And, you know, playing playing a team from that small of a conference, I think that's the result you're looking for. You're looking for a sweep with a maximum of uh, of one close game. I was going to yeah. say, I think a decent early test for your pitching staff. They got some good hitters, small, smaller level team, but guys like Sam Haney, Evan Sullivan, Devin Bade, and I think maybe the scariest guy, their projected leadoff guy, Tommy Reifler, who hit just under 400 last year. I don't know how this team is going to get outs against the Cougars. They, it was a team with a just under 6 ERA, in one of the lowest rate division one conference last year. And they returned a lot of guys, but I don't know, man, returning production off a staff that almost has six ERA may necessarily be the best thing. I am intrigued. They have a West Virginia transfer, Chris sleeper who had respectable numbers in two seasons at West Virginia. Didn't pitch a whole, whole ton, but did pitch enough to be on the 2022 big 12 all freshman team. Kind of got lost in the shuffle last year. They returned last year's Friday starter. First team all conference guy, Gabe Driscoll. I'm sure that's who we'll see in the opener, but yeah, I think, a lot, a lot of different ways of saying the Cougs should probably win three of three in this one and win three of three mostly convincingly. Yeah, if you don't win three of three, it's not exactly the start you you want um, for building that resume. We're just like no bad loss. We're no bad losses. Oh no, a bad loss. <laughs> yeah. These, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, speaking of games that are in that, uh, you don't want to have a bad loss here. Houston's first midweek game will be on Tuesday when they'll host Prairie View A and M. Uh, the Panthers were. 290 out of 305 teams in the RPI last year. So that is the beginning and end of my preview of the Prairie View A&M Panthers. Yep. I will. I, I won't argue. Continue on, sir. All right. We'll continue on to the other bat and ball sport, which is in season. That's Cougar softball, who this past weekend went four and one in a home event to open their season. Houston opened up the weekend to dominating their inferior opponents, Colgate in Indiana State for three games uh, with a pair of run rule victories, followed by a six to one win. And then came the one real opponent in this event, Rutgers, who was decent, but not regional good last year. Uh, Houston's first test of the year didn't go well. They lost 10 to two. They scored two runs in the first inning and then got skunked the rest of the way. But Houston got a second shot at the Scarlet Scarlet Knights. And it was one that I think was important for them to take advantage of, you know, both from a confidence standpoint and also just from a resume standpoint, I think two losses against Rutgers makes the weekend an overall negative. You split, and I think it's kind of a push, essentially. Um, and in that second chance, Houston struck in the first inning again, uh, putting up a four spot behind a three-run homer from Vree Cantu. But deja vu, Rutgers starts chipping away, getting back into it, run in the second, run in the third. Uh, but Taria Coleman crushed a huge two-run home run in the bottom of the third to make it 6-2 to two Houston. 
The Cougars were able to ice it from there and won six to three to move to four and one on the year. Funny enough, this was the funniest thing for me, Bobby, that the pitching duo I expected to lead the way for Houston, Shelby Smith and Nicole Badeau, got hit hard by Rutgers in the loss on Saturday. And then Paris Lehman uh, threw six strikings after uh, Tammy Waiters opened for Houston in the, uh, the nice uh, comeback win on Sunday. Yeah, that first Rutgers game, I had it on while uh, the the men's basketball game was on. You know, I kind of was double screening it, dual screening with my phone and whatnot. And you kind of got this feeling that once the floodgates kind of opened against Rutgers in that first game, it wasn't that like the team gave up, but it was definitely one of those where you could just kind of tell that they were like, all right, we've played a lot of softball. This isn't going well in like the floodgates opened. And, and we just got taken down by it. And then come back Sunday, let's battle back. And they did. So um, like you said, losing two to Rutgers really kind of hurts your weekend. But getting that uh, getting that uh, win against them on Sunday, when the when the uh, time had moved, they they moved it up because of the of the weather. So that takes you off the schedule that you were already kind of planning all of that. Um, and to come back and, and get that six three win is uh, is massive. Yeah, I mean, four and one isn't the best case scenario for this opening weekend, but it, it's not the worst either. I, I think considering this is a largely new roster outside of a handful of position players, I think a decent opening weekend. I've been burned by multiple U of H sports recently doing well early against inferior competition. So I won't go any further with that in terms of my endorsement, but I think things to be encouraged by. And like you guys have said, really Paris Lehman deserves a shout out in this one. Six innings of two run ball in the win, uh, relieving Tanya uh, to my waiters and, to I think get out of that uh, jam that uh, she was like put into with uh, where waiters walking the first two batters she faced really impressive. Also dealing with a rain delay in the middle of her six innings pitched. I think you can't overstate that. I mean, this is this weekend was the first time she had pitched since 2022. She missed all of last year, I believe hurt. So I, I was really impressed by, uh, by what I saw. Definitely your most effective pitcher in the circle. I mean, I know you had some questions about the fact that coming in, she's had one, one season of college experience and didn't have like the most, sparkling numbers or freshman season nickels but I, I think also also worth reminding us you know she's a she was a true freshman that year like mm-hmm. players develop like players improve and I, I think I'm not gonna say oh we saw a future ace this weekend but we saw a lot of good stuff I, I thought she really she pounded the zone which I, I think was really good like I, I think you're not gonna see a lot of for better or for worse free base uh, runners from her this year could translate something good could translate into something not so good I think we really don't know at this point but Really like what I saw early. A lot of standout hitters from opening weekend uh, as well. Kennedy Thomas, an incredible 9 of 12 at the plate. Uh, Taria Coleman, as you'd expect, led the Cougars with three home runs, hit 455 for the weekend. Uh, two of your other expected impact transfers, Jasmine Rollin, Lair, Butte, both hit really well. Also kind of like we expected, but I really wanted to single out freshman Michaela Nita, who uh, I think we mentioned her in our preview. She hit 429 this weekend. I think somebody who's going to be a really exciting player here and definitely a lineup mainstay in the current season. Yeah, I think this opening weekend went pretty much exactly as as you thought. You know, the bats are going to put up runs. Can the pitching hold on? And and for those five games, the pitching held on. So moving forward, Houston will be hosting the Houston Classic this coming weekend. The event was originally scheduled for Friday to Sunday, but games are being spread into Thursday to try to get as many games as possible in with the expected bad weather coming to Houston over the weekend. The Cougs are currently scheduled to play Two games each against Nichols State and Northwestern State, who finished 157 and 160 in the RPI last year, and then single games against UTSA and UMass, both of whom finished well into the 200s. So, um, you know, we'll see if Houston actually gets six games in like they currently have on the schedule. But, you know, this is is even like a lighter, uh, you know, opponent group than you faced on opening weekend. There's, There's not even a Rutgers caliber team. So, uh, this is, you know, one where I think if, if you get those six in five and one is kind of has to be the, uh, the minimum and, you know, ideally really going uh six and oh, yeah, I was harsher. I said, I said six and oh or nothing in my notes. Like the, yeah, this is the, these are opponents. You need to do what you did, which to their credit, you did not play around with your food when it came to Colgate, Indiana state weekend. Number one, that's good. Keep that going to weekend. Number two, please. As many games as you can get in. Yeah, absolutely. I don't have much to add over. This is one of those, uh, Weekends where your resume can take a massive hit, but it doesn't do much for your resume. All right. Well, uh, more in-season sports. We've got women's hoops who in their game since our most recent episode lost 
69 to 52 in their one game that was at Kansas on Thursday. Sam, you and I said we were going to come say something nice about this team if they kept it within 10. I guess we I guess we don't have to do that. Uh, sure don't. I feel like you can copy and paste my audio from one of our several previous episodes recapping a women's basketball conference game. I mean, the team kept it competitive for half, uh, but once again, their opponent pulled away in the second. The team really struggled to make much happen offensively, and like I kind of predicted, a high-level opposing uh, post player had a career night. All that happened at Allen Fieldhouse, though, I guess you could say truthfully, the women's game was more competitive for a greater percentage of the on-court action than the men's game was, uh, even if the final margin of defeat was slightly larger. That, that is my that is my finding the tiniest, uh, almost uh, imperceptible to human eye silver lining mm-hmm. in the clouds. But yeah, the post player I kind of mentioned a moment ago, Tiana Jackson, 25 points, 15 boards, nine blocks, guys. Not not great. You're going to block nine times. You're probably, uh, by one player, you're probably not going to be winning that basketball game. The Cougs shot 7-37 to in the third and fourth quarters. KU shot 50% or better in three or four quarters. A stat I feel like I have said for, like, six different Big 12 conference games. I mean, I I don't know what else to say, guys. The team is 0-5 in road Big 12 games. Really, only the OT loss at UCF has met any definition competitive. I mean, it's discouraging. I think I think any coaching staff of this team would have struggled to win more than the three conference games we have right now in year one of the league. But to be at that point with a very veteran team and to not really be competitive in most of those nine losses, I think that's the specific part that's discouraging to me right now. Like since he right now is struggling, since he also has a first year alumna of the program head coach who you could say right now in year one there, okay, maybe there's a long-term plan here. This is year 11 of this coach. What's 10. the long-term plan here, guys, right? 10 or 11? Year 10. Year 10, yeah. year 10 my bad. Yeah, Off on you. Year 10. year 10. What's the plan here, guys? Yeah, I mean, looking at the stats, look at this fourth quarter. Granted. I, I prefer not to, Bobby. I did it granted, earlier. I prefer you not know, to. It was like a 12-point game at this point, but the Cougs went 2 of 18 from the field, 1 of 7 from 3, which means you went 1 of 11. Nine percent from the from inside the arc. Nine percent. Nine percent. That's. I told you I didn't want to look at that, Bobby. I told you that's it. Fast break points two, second chance points twenty, points off turnovers thirteen. That's all you got. Meanwhile, your opponent shoots fifty percent. Just points off turnovers. They had twelve. We had 13. Guys, we play a high pressure turnover focused. The, the two fast basketball. break points is throwing me. Like, how do we have only two fast break points given this? I, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what to say, fellas. I don't know what to say. Speaking of, I don't know what to say. Women's basketball is going to host the Longhorns on Wednesday. And uh, it's another game in which a uh, team wearing burnt orange is going to, is going to kick Houston's butts. So. Valentine's uh, Day mask. Uh, yeah, I don't know what to say about that one. Other than you know what's going to be crazy though, it's Valentine's Day, and I'm glad that I'm <laughs> not going to be paying any attention to the game whatsoever. You know what's going to happen though? This game's going to be close. Like I don't know calling why. Your shot here, you, you, you I'm, put I'm calling the shot. I'm not saying we're going to win. I'm not saying we're going to win, but this one feels like something that you know we hold them. It, when I say close, I mean it all relative. Right. I, I could see this being like a 10, 12 point game where Texas is kind of playing with their food in the fourth quarter and we we keep it closer than I think like they, they played oh. since it was like in the low teens in the final margin. I guess I could see something like that. Yeah. So last week I said if Houston keeps it within single digits against Kansas, so I would say nothing something nice about this program. Bobby, if they keep it within, I'll even say 12 points against Texas. I will come back next week and say something nice about you since you made that. <laughs> I'll, okay. I'll, co- I'll co-sign. Okay. I'll jump on I'm that in. too. I'm now I'm re- I already cheered my heart out for women's basketball, but I'm definitely doing it now. Look, my wife's got to work tomorrow, so I got nothing better to do than watch this game. Let's go, boys. Expect expect updates because I I will be I will be taking my lovely sniffing other to the uh the brand new Las Vegas Strip Whataburger for a romantic dinner. <laughs> you. you guys uh, gonna feed like uh 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 honey barbecue uh, chicken strip sandwiches to each other like link your arms and like feed them to cannot each confirm other. or deny. <laughs> Uh, Cougar women's basketball will be back at home or will be on the road I should say uh this weekend on Saturday they will be at Oklahoma State. Uh, 
I know Oklahoma State, not one of the better teams in the conference. Sam, any chance this is Houston's first uh, Big 12 road win? You know, if this game was happening in Houston, I could probably like make the case for the Cougars winning this one because Oak State has not been great away from Stillwater. They have some like close losses that still make me think that this game was in Houston probably would not be a Cougar win. No, I am not uh, predicting that. For this one, they, like, they don't have the greatest looking record. They're 11 and 12 overall, 4 and 8 in conference play, but they're also top 60 in net. And again, frankly, I wouldn't be wild about the Cougs' chances uh, in Houston because they've been competitive in basically all of their league losses. They just had an absolute heartbreaker they dropped over the weekend uh, at number seven, K State. If U of H was 4 and 8 right now in league play, guys, kind of like we were talking about earlier, but most of those losses were competitive, I really do think you'd hear a different tone from the three of us about this season when we came back here to talk about this team. And I think the individual matchup that's really tamping down my optimism is uh, there. You know, stop me if it sounds familiar. OSU has a uh, really good uh, post player that I am positive is going to have a career night uh, against us. In this case, it's junior Hannah Guster, a 6'5 uh, uh, player, junior currently averaging, I said that twice, uh, 14.6 points per game. Again, if recent history is any indicator, she will probably beat her season average. Guys, this was a weird fact about this game that threw me off. Do you realize this is the first time a U of H team is traveling to Stillwater for a Big 12 sporting event this year? I had to double check oh. it, but I mean, the football game was in Houston. The two yeah. the soccer teams didn't play. They don't sponsor volleyball. The men's basketball game was in Houston. It's the first time. Um, right. Do not think we'll be commemorating that with a win, uh, unfortunately, as much as I would like to be wrong about that fact. Yep. Yeah. Uh, seems, <laughs> seems more than fair, honestly. <laughs> and well, as we are well into this episode, I think we'll just go ahead and leave that there and uh, and keep it moving as we got three more sports to uh, to get in here. So uh, let's move right along to Cougar Track and Field, which uh, this past weekend hosted the Howie Ryan Invitational, as well as sending athletes to a couple of other events. Uh, and Christian Sampy uh, rebroke his school record in the pole vault once again for I think the second or third time this year, clearing 18 feet, five and a quarter inches. Uh, excuse me, out at the Don Kirby Invitational in Albuquerque that moved him up to number three in the country on the year. And then Houston got good value for its money in Boston. They sent two athletes to the David Henry Valentine Invitational and both won their events and set program records for U of H. Uh, Sydney Townsend in the 400 meters, Claire Meyer in the 5,000 meters, something in that Boston air just makes you run fast or something, I guess. Uh, and then back in Houston, David Ajama had his best mark as a Cougar in the triple jump at 51 feet, 11 and a quarter inches, good for 19th in the country. So uh, kind of just outside of that top 16 that you want to hit in uh, in indoors in order to get yourself qualified for nationals. So that is Houston's uh, second to last weekend of regular season uh, indoor track and field. They'll have athletes competing at the Air Force Air, I just realized I put it in my notes as Air Force, F-O-R-S-T. That's not a word. <laughs> uh, Air Force, last chance, and the LSU Twilight meets this coming weekend before uh, Big 12 Indoor Championships the weekend after that. So I don't know if you just saw, but the uh, Cougar men's track and field debuted at uh, number 24 in the team rankings this past week after some more impressive performances from guys like Sampi and Ajama. So excited to uh, you know finish up the regular season and uh, ready to get into Houston's first ever uh, Big 12 Championship in a couple of weeks. And then uh, next up, uh, Bobby, I believe you're gonna you're gonna give us the latest update on some in in progress Cougar golf events. Yeah, so we have some uh, Cougar golf, like you said, they are in the middle of their events, um, but we pretty much know what's about to happen just based on where the Cougars stand currently. I'm gonna start with the men's tournament, uh, men's men's team. Uh, they're actually not participating as a team in a couple of events. They sent players to. Different events uh, in the Houston area. He got one at, in Humble at the Golf Club of Houston uh, called the Houston Classic, which isn't hosted by U of H. It's hosted by some, uh, what was it? It's some random Oklahoma college is like hosting the event here. It, it was very weird. Um, but you have one there, and then you have the Bentwater Intercollegiate in Montgomery. Uh, some smaller events. Uh, like I said, the Cougars aren't sending any uh, as a team. They're not going. They sent a bunch of individuals. Figure it's close to Houston. Go get some of your uh, lower end players. Uh, not lower end, but some of your some of your younger players. Some of the guys who you don't think are going to be in your starting five heading into the season. Uh, a little bit of tournament experience. 
Over at the Houston Classic, you have Hudson Weibel, who is A and Bryant Hiskey, who are both T14 at plus seven, um, which is fine. They're playing some schools that aren't the biggest um, that you that you've heard of. And Jacob Barrow is uh, plus five. He's uh, T8 in that event as well. If this were a team event, Cougs would probably be doing pretty well right now. But you would expect them to playing teams like Midwestern State, Central Oklahoma, uh, Henderson State, Mississippi College, Oklahoma Christian, uh, West Texas A&M. You would hope Houston is uh, is winning that event. But again, they didn't send anyone as a player. Um, and then over in uh, Montgomery, you have Grant Doggett. He's plus sixth, T17. Uh, maybe a little bit lower than you would want. Again, not a team competition, uh, but doing fine. Um, nothing too exciting since it's not the team and that's kind of how conference goes and things like that. That being said, we do have women's golf and they are participating in their first tournament of the year. And it's kind of been a tough week for the lady Cougs in the Bahamas. Um, they are getting to travel to Nassau for, um, this tournament. They play in it every year. Um, currently they are eighth out of 11 teams in this tournament. Uh, freshman Malin Kim is leading the Cougs through two rounds. We have one more round to go. Uh, the big surprise, though, is Moa is she went out and shot a 79 and a 78, much higher than you typically see from her. So um, very uncharacteristic. Uh, one thing I talked about in the preseason preview was how the team can go really low, but the next round will go very high at times. Um, and this tournament is the perfect example of that. Not that we like calling players out, but just... For an example, Natalie St. Germain posted a 72, followed it up the next day with an 80. You can kind of get that 72 and an 80 down to a 74 and a 74 or a 75 and a 75, right? We can go a little bit higher on one day if that means we can lower the high end a little bit. Um, again, not the best tournament for the Lady Cougs, but I'm not selling my stock. Still a lot to look forward to with the uh with the team now one thing i do want to complain about is um it's usually pretty easy to find golf stats uh through a wonderful website called golfstat.com they track the tournaments they do all that you can preview other tournaments this new system you click on the upcoming tournament which i wanted to do for the men's team i have no idea who's playing in this tournament i have no idea who's playing in the border olympics right now it's impossible to find I've looked in like three different places. I would love to give you a preview about the Cougars um, next tournament that they're hosting, but you click on the border preview, you click on the border Olympics and you pretty much get nothing out of it. So just a wonderful, wonderful uh, spike mark um, production when the NCAA changed over from golf stat. They really kind of screwed things up on that. So that's yeah. neither here nor there. No, but golf that's stat's just, awesome. Like, well, like that, it, it is like it, it is like you look at it, it's like it reminds you kind of of the 1990s internet. Yep. It also gives you every it gives you like easy like oh how these how these players do on par threes like a quick breakdown of how each team is doing like just it what extremely like not fixing a real problem by uh, getting rid of golf stat. Yeah, so just just it's it, it was such a terrible move and it was all because um, coaches didn't know how golf stat established their rankings and it wasn't as clear as they wanted it to be. So it was just, just bad. So that's just my little, that's just my little rant. Sorry. There you go. I, uh, I will stop there. Um, just good job NCA. You did a great job. And then finally, uh, Sam Cougar tennis, uh, did, did not have the week we were hoping for. I think it's safe to say Cougar tennis got a lot of exercise, uh, this past weekend, but I, I mean, <laughs> I, I I'm sorry off the joke. It's just it's it's rough. It's it's probably the roughest weekend of Cougar tennis like since we've you know done a podcast here talking about it. like lost to uh, UTRGV for the first time since those programs ever competed head to head. I looked at the history, guys. Not just that this was the first loss in the entirety of Helena Bezovich's tenure at U of H, which dates back to 2018. You've played UTRGV almost every year. Like I, I wouldn't say, go so far as to say they're an annual play. I think there's like a year or two in there that you can go head to head. But just just about every actually no 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 actually every every season you have faced UTRGV. Uh, I correct what I said earlier, guys. In the entirety of those head to heads, U of H had lost had had given up four points total to UTRGV's tennis program prior to uh, 
uh, last Friday's head to head where you lost four to three. And what kills me, it wasn't one of those things where, oh, you just, you came out a little cold, um, lost the doubles point and just kind of had to play from behind. You won the doubles point. You actually sweat, you won all three doubles matches. So you swept that. I actually watched a little bit of it, uh, waiting for, uh, for softball to start in the, uh, in the late morning out here before the Cougs took on Colgate and softball and looked pretty good. And then promptly lost, uh, four of your six, uh, singles matches. And say what you will about this program the past several seasons, this is a program that you didn't have issues with the UTRGVs in the schedule. It would be, be like, oh, we beat them six to one. Dustin, and I would say 90 minutes to three, 90 seconds to three minutes about that specific game and kind of like, okay. And in the back of your mind, it's like, okay, well, when this team faces maybe the tougher opponents, probably not going to go so hot. It's not going so hot right now against like the lowest rated teams in the schedule. It doesn't really make sense. I mean, you lost also, we'll get, keep with the on court action for a second. You lost four to two to Louisiana tech, which is a bit less surprising. I was allowing myself a bit of hope in that one. I got moved to Monday uh, for rain. I saw an update while I was at work though. The team took the doubles point. I was like, Oh, okay. That's cool. Like maybe you'll steal something there. Nope. Uh, lost four of the five singles matches before, you know, they called it because U of H had no mathematic way of uh, getting back in this one. So I, I would just say that result may be not as surprising, a little disappointing, but just losing UTRGV lose almost losing to ULA on the opener, losing to a not that great UNT team in Denton. I don't know if this team has double digit wins in them this year. And it's hard to explain because this isn't a situation where, okay, well you have a lot of new faces guys. You have precisely one new player regularly seeing action. Nina Scorch. Everyone else has been in this program just about multiple years. Athletes who actually weren't bad against like the middle of the American competition or against the, you know, the non-conference opponents that you expect to beat. And, I know tennis can be kind of an individual sport, can be kind of a lonely sport, but it's it's hard to explain. And I thought this team, I thought I could make a pretty decent case, Dustin, when we previewed them a couple episodes ago that, hey, this might not be the worst team in the Big 12. Hate to say it, after four matches, that uh, dead last in the Big 12 ranking looks pretty dead on, and uh, I have a hard time. Maybe, again, could turn it around, but have a hard time seeing it get better before it gets a lot worse. It is so baffling with it being so many of the same players as last year. Like you said, yeah, this team, yeah. Not, not great last year, but not this bad at least. And uh, yeah, yeah. A week ago, even a week ago, I think, you know, my, my biggest concern for Houston having a team finish last in the big 12 might've been softball. And then that was even with me making an argument, an argument that I, I at least somewhat believe that they, they won't finish last, but uh, yeah, tennis might be uh, grabbing that mantle and going, no, 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 we're going to, we're going to be the one that, uh, that is the first, uh, first big, the first Houston team to ever finish last place in the big 12 and something. Yeah. Yeah. Love to be wrong, but yeah, just again, don't see it and don't have an easy explanation for it. Like Mm -hmm. you have a bunch of new players and I don't know, maybe it forces a change that uh, needed to happen as much as Lana Bezovich has done a solid job here the past several seasons, because I kind of penciled this little early stretch in as like a three and one, four, no three and one at the absolute worst. And, you're one in three with a very narrow margin of win for that one. So wish I was ending the episode on a more happy note, but I think that's just the reality with this program. And uh, yeah, I think we'll, uh, we'll end it here. If you guys don't mind. Nope. Let's end it right here. And on our way out, going to give a big thank you to our Scott Holman podcast, Patreon supporters for your continuing ongoing support of the work that we are doing uh, every week to bring you the latest, greatest Cougar news. Uh, if you uh, appreciate this podcast, you feel like you can afford $5 a month. We'd love for you to go to patreon.com slash SH podcast. You can sign up, uh, do us a solid. That'd be very much appreciated. Uh, if you'd like to say hi, you can email us SH podcast at gmail.com. You can tweet at us at SH podcast. You can uh, blue sky at us at uh, podcast.bsky.social. Uh, that's going to make it, that's going to be it for us. If you made it all the way to the end, you are an absolute rock star. And as always, go Cougs.